JIT is one of those newfangled business acronyms that's thrown around in board meetings and on news sites all the time. But what is it? What does it have to do with Android? That's what we're going to learn on today's episode of the Android Power User. So JIT, sometimes pronounced JIT, what is it? Well, it stands for just in time. It's always good to be on time, right? Well, what does it mean? For that, we got to go to logistics. You ready for this one? We'll keep it short. In logistics, supply and demand, production lines, assembly lines, whatever you want to call it, JIT is the concept of having inventory delivered just when you need it, just in time. If you're a manufacturer of widgets and you need some cogs, well, you don't want to have a whole bunch of cogs on hand because, well, inventory is expensive. Warehouses to hold that inventory are expensive. Insurance to prevent uh, or to make up for break-ins on those cogs is expensive. So if you can cut down all of that inventory and get your stuff just in time, well, you're great. Unfortunately, there are some drawbacks to that, like what happens if there's a hurricane or a flood or you don't have a reliable cog maker. Darn cogs, well. Well, in that case, you're going to have problems on your production line. But that's kind of where the JIT metaphor breaks down. So what are we talking in terms of JIT and Android? JIT in computers, and let's face it, Androids are computers, comes down to something that's sometimes referred to as dynamic translation. Essentially, you're running your program right when you need it. But you're not really running it, and that's where things get a little bit complicated. So before we uncomplicate things, we gotta lay a little background. In computers, computer development, I'm a developer for my day job. I write code all day long. But the code that I write is all C-sharp.net. I've coded in other stuff. I've coded in Pascal and Visual Basic and C and C++ and even in Java. But they're all essentially the same thing. They are a programming language. It's somewhat easy to program in a programming language, at least when compared to programming in native code. Native code is the code that programs are run in. So if you want to run any application, any program at all, desktop, tablet, smartphone, doesn't matter you have to run it in native code. That's all computers know how to run is native code. It wasn't written in native code, it might have been written in Objective-C or Java. So how does it get from those over into native code? The way that all works is something called compilation. The process of compiling is essentially translating your code which is kind of human readable and easy to understand, at least for geeks like me, into something that's really complicated and hard for me to read, but easy for a computer to read and to execute. That's the key right there, being able to actually execute or run the program or app. Downsides to compiling. Compiling takes time. Head on over to pocketnow.com, look at the uh, little comic I've got on that. It's, it's awesome. Though I don't necessarily like fencing, laser tag during compiling, you know what I'm talking about. Awesome. But compiling, it takes time and there are limitations. So let's step in the Wayback Machine and talk about Windows Mobile, before it was called Windows Mobile. Way back then, we had PDAs running an operating system. It was Windows CE. And on that OS, we could install apps, though back then they were called programs. Those programs came in various different formats, and you had to know which one you needed to run it on your particular device. See, back then we had Strongarm, we had MIPS, I think we even had a couple other processors out there. Each processor has advantages and disadvantages, but they couldn't run each other's programs. So as a developer, you would write the code once in your common language, whether that's VB or whatever, and then you'd compile it but you'd compile it for each one of these processors. So at the end of the day, you'd end up with like four or five programs, but they wouldn't be able to run except on one particular platform. And well, Windows Mobile or Pocket PC or whatever we called it back then, 
there were lots of different manufacturers and each one kind of liked having their own different processor. So you had to have different executables for each processor. Kind of a pain in the neck, especially for developers who essentially now have to compile it five times. Not cool. So what does any of this have to do with Android? After all, Android apps are written in Java, right? Oh, well, yes they are, but they're not run in Java. They're run in, you guessed it, machine code. How do we get it from point A to point B, and how come you don't have to pick from like five or six different versions of an app when you're going to the Play Store? Very good questions. Okay, so the Play Store thing has a couple different answers. First of all, you really shouldn't see apps that aren't compatible with your device. Plain and simple. The Play Store does a fairly good job at doing that. Sure, you might see them, but you won't be able to install them. It's close. And yes, there are different versions of different apps for different platforms and screen resolutions and whatnot, but we're not going to get into that today. Instead, what we're going to talk about is something that Android does that's a little bit different. You see, it runs all of your apps in what's called a virtual machine. Again, we're not going to talk too much about that today. Instead, we're going to talk about something that happened, well, somewhat recently. It's been a while, but it didn't come around with the invent of Android when it was first released. And it's called the JIT compiler, or running in JIT in the compiler. Okay, what does all that mean? That's a lot of jargon and acronyms. JIT, when applied to computing, means we're taking our uncompiled code that we as developers write, we as developers publish to the Play Store, our own websites, some other market, really doesn't matter, and somehow it gets onto your phone. Once it's on your phone, you need to run it. Well, to be able to run it, it has to be compiled. Compiling, as we already discussed, takes time. That time translates into something that we like to call lag. You push a button on the screen, and it just sits there and waits for a while and thinks, oh, and, and then it does something. That lag is just painful. It's not enjoyable, it's not fun, it's not smooth, and it's not fast. So that's the way things kind of used to work. They would be automatically compiled when you ran them. Now that sounds like just in time, but it's not. Just in time, or JIT, was introduced into Android some time ago, and it really sped things up quite a bit because it would compile your code right when you wanted to run it. And not all of it, just the stuff that you needed to be able to run. And then it got kind of super smart and it started predicting what code you'd need to compile next or what com code it would need to compile next for you to be able to run. Does any of this make sense? Let's back up. So I have an app. I install it on my phone or my tablet. I go ahead and tap the icon. What happens then is that app, portions of it, are dynamically compiled on the fly, just enough to get me started. Once that's done, then the rest is kind of pre-compiled and put into cache. Yes, that's kind of an oversimplification of how things work. We do that quite a bit on Android Power User, but it gives you the idea. Just what you need is compiled just when you need it it's a lot faster. And then in the background, the other stuff is dynamically compiled and cached for when you need it. It's very intelligent. Now, what does this let us do? Let's back up for just a minute. I may have an Android smartphone and an Android tablet, and they may be running exactly the same processor. Or I may be running an Android tablet, and the next Android phone that comes out, it might not be running a Snapdragon processor. It might be running an Intel possible, but the Intel processor doesn't have the same code base as that Snapdragon. It's a different architecture. What does that mean? Well, in the Windows Mobile days, that means every single app developer who has ever written an app for any version of Android has to now recompile their app and redistribute it for both the Snapdragon and the Intel processors. It's a pain. It's never going to happen. So all of this gets kind of muddled together and it would be painful. So Intel essentially would never be able to make a processor that Android would run on unless they switched over to the Snapdragon architecture, which they're just not going to do. That would mean that we'd all be relegated just to Snapdragon. That's not to say Snapdragon isn't great. It's just 
Don't we want to be able to do other stuff? Don't we want that freedom as Android enthusiasts? Don't we want that freedom? Of course we do. So the way Android is built, all you have to do, if you're Intel, is rewrite Android, not rewrite it, but recompile it, translate it, make it run on your infrastructure, on your architecture, on your chips. Great. Once you have that done, and yes, that includes the operating system, that includes drivers, that includes all the, uh, the apps that you need that are native apps run, written in native code, you've got to translate those. But then all of the other apps that are run through this JIT compiler, they're going to work just fine. Why? Because once you get that translator working, anything that's pre-written will run on anybody else's platform. That's really the beauty of JIT. That's why it's so amazing and we're not even living up to that potential yet. So right now all we have to do is live with, you know, the increased speed, the apps running just when you need them, the saved memory, the buttery smoothness. It, we'll just have to make do with that. But in the future, in the future we'll be able to support many different platforms and hopefully we'll see an Intel one that we can actually buy sometime soon. So that's the nuts and the bolts behind what this JIT does. Now there's something else involved there and it's called Dalvik. But that's going to be the topic for another episode of the Android Power User. If you like this kind of discussion, make sure you give the video a big thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure you hit the link at the end of the video so that you can be notified when we have new episodes, not just of Android Power User, but other Android, even Windows Phone and iPhone stuff as well. We'll go ahead and let you know right there, quick and easy. If you'd like to discuss, comment, uh, ask questions, make sure you follow the link right down at the bottom of this, if you're watching this on YouTube, so you can go over to the discussion at pocketnow.com. That's where we'll be having that. For Pocket Now, the Android Power user, I'm Joe Levi. Thanks for watching.